So thank you everyone. Hello, welcome to my talk today. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak as well about the work of Freshwater Habitats Trust and some of the things we have found out about the lives of freshwater mollusks over the last 20 or 30 years or so. Um, I will necessarily be quite brief about many of the things we have discovered, but hopefully you'll still find that interesting. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit about the history of our organization over the three decades since we were founded and um, some of the key findings over that time and the more, impo more important practical projects that we've been running in that period. And then I'm going to look at the end, the last uh, quarter of an hour or so, briefly at what our priorities are for the next decade. Um, so as you just heard, we were uh, we were founded a few years ago. We were founded in 1988 as the organization Pond Action. And we became Pond Conservation and Water Habitats Trust in 2004. And then finally, um, we relaunched in 2013 as the Freshwater Habitats Trust right from the word go. Although we, we've had a special connection with ponds, we were always interested in all kinds of fresh waters. It, it just took us a while to um, get the, the confidence for one reason or another, I'll, I'll explain briefly, to rename ourselves just Freshwater Habitats Trust. Um, we're a, a, a charity with uh, 30 or so staff doing research and policy and practical conservation projects. We're active across the UK and we have a lot of contacts with the rest of Europe, although at the moment we don't actually do practical work over on the continent. Um, our, our conservation on the ground is focused Although we're doing surveys and, and advisory work all over the country, our practical work is focused in the south. We have a special focus in the New Forest and through the south of central England. In the Midlands, uh, we have projects in the north of England practically going on and, uh, and we're working in Wales practically too. And we're helped by hundreds of volunteers from various times and, and landowners. We have a lot of landowners working with us all over uh, those areas that we're working practically. And our, our mission as an organization is in fact, we're just rewriting this at the moment. So this is almost the very final wording of this, but it might change very slightly. Um, but our mission is to reverse the long decline of life in fresh water by creating a, a national network of healthy and unpolluted and in connect, interconnected freshwater landscapes, which are, and uh, this is one of our, hopefully one of our future slogans, wilder, wetter, cleaner, and connected. Um, so this afternoon, I'm, as I say, I'm going to talk about our history and work together. Um, of course, it's not as neat in reality as I'm going to make it appear today. We, when we started, we didn't know what, what was going to turn out 20 or 30 years later. And it's not as planned quite as one can make it seem talking about it in retrospect. But we roughly have, I'm, I'm going to talk in roughly four main phases, the 80s to the 90s, the 2000s, 2010 onwards, and then the future. Um, with the late 80s and 90s being a period when we ran the, started and ran the National Pond Survey and some related projects and began to be interested in river restoration. In the <laughs> 2000s, we moved on to landscape ecology, what lives where, the understanding of small waters, uh, and we transitioned more into a delivery phase at that point. Up to that, we'd been mostly thinking about collecting data and telling people, giving people advice. From 2010 onwards, we've been working a lot around the concepts of catchments of water-friendly farming and what makes a difference for freshwater biodiversity. And then, as I say, I'll talk to you a bit about our future plans for the Freshwater Network at the end. Um, we, as I said, as I've hinted, we have a special relationship with ponds because that's where we started. Because when we started back in 1988, ponds were, uh, were, were just as popular then as they are now, but they were almost unknown scientifically. And um, by chance, and that was what prompted us to work with ponds first, uh, but by chance, they've turned out to be much more important than we ever really expected. Um, but having said that, from the earliest days, from the 90s, we were actually funded by WWF to set up to set up a freshwater conservation organisation. Um, so right from the word go, we have been working on ponds, but it took us a while to, we, the ponds got so big for us, we didn't want to leave, leave them out of our name for quite a long time. Uh, and it was only recently that we really thought, well, it's we, we're talking about freshwater, it'll be better for the ponds to be called freshwater habitats than to go on talking about ponds. Um, so from for many years we've been interested in a whole range of habitats so we've um, here we've there's some of our experimental ditches in Leicestershire in the product projects in the uh, that was that was 10 years ago now that we were doing those sorts of projects we've continued that in different formats we've obviously interested in the, the fen and drainage systems 
Uh, we've had a long running interest in streams of all sorts and shapes and sizes. And for example, here in the water friendly farming project, we're looking at testing the effect of adding new habitats to them. These are woody debris dams and seeing what the effects of those are. Uh, we, we like lakes. We've we're especially interested in small lakes because we developed a national assessment system called the SIM system, which uh, allows us to assess, to assess the ecological quality both of ponds and small lakes up to five hectares. And here is a picture of one of those such lakes that's one of our favourites, Hatchet Pond, which is a special area of conservation in the New Forest, and also an incredibly uh, controversial location. That's that's some fish removal that we instigated to try and improve the quality of the habitat because there it is it's under a bit of pressure and um, not in good condition. And you can see that I've just pasted on the pictures there from the local press about what the local carp fishermen thought about that. One of our most difficult sites to work with. Um, some of our earliest work being based in Oxford was uh, included survey work on the River Thames. Uh, and that kind of work still continues. And we've long been interested in gravel pit lakes like those here this, in this picture of the lower Windrush Valley, um, also in Oxfordshire. So in those first years, from the late 1980s through to the 1990s, we were really involved in three main things. And I just want to touch briefly on these before talking a little bit about the result, some of the results from our work in the National Pond Survey. We began with a survey of the ponds of Oxfordshire. Um, this is just a picture of the cover of the report from a long time ago now, um, which was really our very first piece of work. Um, we started that in 1988 after a couple of years of planning, and we, we actually we actually did it with staff who were employed on the on the Thatcher era job creation scheme, the Manpower Services Commission, which some of you may remember. Um, and that was simply really a survey of the plants and invertebrates of a set of about 120 ponds of, of all kinds of quality, good, both good and bad condition across the county with a, a subset of 30 of those that we eventually worked on in, in a bit more detail and took on with this into the future a bit more. Um, and one of the first things we did at that stage was to actually define what a pond was, because when we started, there was actually no reliable definition of a pond. Um, and we sort of invented this definition that they were small waters between a meter square and two hectares in area, which held water for four months of the year or more. And, and that kind of stuck. Um, we, we chose this very simple size based definition because all the other traditional definition of ponds, which involved things like whether there were waves on the on the water body or how far light could penetrate or whether plants could grow all the way through. All of these simply didn't really work because uh, unless you went and did a whole load of measurements first, you never knew whether when you turned up at a water body, whether it would actually be a pond or not. So that was, of course, for survey work, completely impossible. Um, so we went for this much simpler definition, and that now has effectively been built, built into British conservation law. Um, some of those early ponds, I thought I'd just show you a few pictures of Oxfordshire ponds, just to give you a sense of what we're talking about here. Um, this is a, a temporary pond that uh, dries out in the in the height of the summer. Here you see it in the uh, in the late spring, uh, late winter, early spring. This is a site for the uncommon stonework, tassel stonework, which is a priority plant. Um, this is one of my favourite ponds. It looks like a bit of a battle battleground. This is the central pond, or not more SSSI. But actually, um, I could give you a whole talk just about this rather wonderful pond. Um, there's a whole interesting set of stories to be said about to be told about this, which you can actually read a bit more of in the, the book, you know, that, that we're, I'm sure some of you know that's um, in, in um, preparation at the moment, we're due to have a new naturalist out sometime this year, it was promised um, this summer, but the latest publication date appears to be the uh, the, the autumn now, we're, we're still waiting, Penny Williams and I, who are the authors, are still waiting the proofs from Collins, we were promised them in April, but they haven't materialised yet, but anyway, there's a bit more about the central ponds and some very interesting stories from that there. It's actually one of the finest ponds in the county, although it looks like, um, a, as I say, a bit of a battle, battle zone there with a, after a few cows have been trampling it. It's actually a very high quality pond with uh, remarkably good water quality, despite a bit of mud there, and set in a landscape which really makes for a very high quality freshwater habitat. And I should just say today, although it's me who gets called the visiting professor by Oxford Brooks, actually a lot of the ideas and, and information I'm talking about today has really been the work of uh, Penny Williams, who is um, who I expect some of you will know the name of at least. Um, she really is one of um, Europe's most outstanding freshwater biologists, but does keep a quite low profile. Another favourite pond of ours from the Oxfordshire Pond Survey days is this pond, the Fowl's Pill, also out on Otmore. It's uh, one of the strongholds in the Upper Thames for water violet, obviously a plant that depends on good quality clean water. Um, and this is perhaps the stronghold for this plant out in, in, the, in the headwaters of the Thames these days. Um, 
this little pond this this is actually a, this dates us a bit this is a you might wonder about the coloring of this slide and that's because it's a picture of a uh, of a of a true transparency of a, of a slide film transparency a picture of a little pond on Beebout's Ash and Meads Nature Reserve in a grassland which is an SSSI so this is an, one of those old-fashioned um, green wing or green winged orchid times of kinds of grasslands that would have once have been common throughout the Midlands and ponds like this would have been commonplace but not so these days and this is though it doesn't look anything particularly special this is the place where we've seen the longest list of water bugs of any pond in Britain so um, despite its modest appearance uh, a, a rather remarkable little spot as well and this picture some of you might recognize this name um, is perhaps the saddest pond I'm going to be telling you about today because Kennington Pit is the location where shortly after we began the Oxford Pond Survey in the late 80s, we rediscovered in England the glutinous snail mixes glutinosa uh, alongside two regionally uncommon plants at that time, two uncommon water plants, but let's we'll just talk about mixus for the moment. And as I'm sure many of you will know, mixus, uh, we, we saw it there for two, half a dozen years perhaps, and then Post 1993, we were no longer able to find it again at that site. And in 2010, it was finally just declared extinct in England by Natural England and is now only known in uh, Wales at Lintegid, where Martin's been working on it. Um, so this is a bit of a sad site for us because this really is the front line of extinction. This species disappeared on our watch. We saw it for a while and then it disappeared, along with the long stalked pond weed and river water drop work for which this site for which Kennington Pit, which is literally just on the edge of Oxford, just on the on the edge of the Oxford Ring Road, were the last sites in the county. And those two have also gone from the whole county now. And to add insult to injury a bit, this site, the, the, the Kennington Pit, uh, will now see the Environment Agency driving the Oxford flood relief channel through it as well. So um, this really is a bit of a, a sad story. But to just to it's not all bad news. Um, so I thought I'd show you a picture of some very tiny ponds uh, in Oxford that were again part of that original survey. These are some little pools in a green lane, again maybe 10 miles north of Oxford, um, which are that look like nothing but are little temporary ponds with clean water. That green lane is actually, a, it provides a nice little protected catchment, no pollution there or only a tiny bit from the atmosphere. And that also is the habitat of um, the endangered tassel stonewort. Um, yeah, okay, it's moved on, good. Um, we did include what you might call damaged locations in the Oxford Pond Survey, because at that time we didn't really understand the difference between ponds that were exposed to pollutants and those that weren't. And this was one in the o Oxford suburbs. It looks a bit of a mess, but isn't quite as bad as it looks like. Actually, it does, it does have some pollution. Uh, people used to dump their rubbish in it as well, although it probably wasn't as bad as it might, wasn't as bad as it looked. This is a temporary pond. Uh, you can see where the water runs up to in the winter on the on the tree line there, that white mark on the tree in the background. Um, although it doesn't look much, this is a site for great crested newts. That in itself is not all that exceptional, though it does make it a, a priority pond. More interesting, though, is that this is the only place in Britain where the uh, little cyclopoid copepod cyclops uh, strenuous singularis. Sorry, there's a, a sketch there of the uh, some of the crucial identification parts. That's the only place in Britain that this uh, little cyclopoid has been seen. I mean, that might be because not many people look for it, but it's still the only location in Britain. Um, so the Oxford Pond Survey was really where we practiced and um, learned some of our craft. And we fairly quickly moved on to one of our most significant projects, the National Pond Survey, which was funded at the time by WWF in the days when WWF standed for Worldwide Fund for Nature and they gave people money to do things instead of keeping it all themselves. But it was also supported really by the huge energy and enthusiasm of my early colleagues who made it possible to do this work. And essentially what we did in the National Pond Survey was to set out to find out what ponds were like when they were in good condition, when they were in, in places where they were going to reach their full potential and not exposed to pollution and not exposed to other damaging human impacts. Um, and the, the map there just shows you the location of the 200 or so sites that we included in that, right from the far north of Scotland down to the very far south coast of, the, of England. We didn't do Northern Ireland. Um, and from that fed some, led some other projects, which I'm really not going to talk much about today, but were the first assessments of the condition of ponds nationally that we did for uh, what was then DETR, the Department of the Environment, Transport and the Regions. Remember John 
Prescott's super, super super department that paid for the first national survey of of the condition of ponds and some other later work that grew out of the national pond survey. But this uh, national pond survey was really a thing that we we ourselves copied the concept from river biologists who in the river lab in Dorset in those days that what later became part of CEH, the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. They realized that looking at high quality rivers was a way of establishing what the was, was a way of getting a baseline against which you could assess the condition of rivers more generally that were impacted. And we copied that approach and went and went and visited a, a nice set of high quality ponds so that we had a, a baseline against which we could judge the quality of ponds generally and, and many other things. This has really helped us, been really fundamental to us throughout the rest of our uh, throughout throughout our work over the rest of the, the time that we've been that we've been around. And in that we invented, I, I'm not, we did plant surveys. I'm not gonna talk about the plants of that program at all today. In that we invented the three minute invertebrate hand net survey deliberately designed to be comparable with the river work. And we developed the technique where we went in three seasons in spring, summer and autumn. And, and as far as possible, identified invertebrates to species level um, as far as our uh, taxonomic skills at the time allowed us to do. And I just thought you might like to see half a dozen pictures of what nice ponds in that national survey looked like. So we had a sense of that. Um, so here's one of the perhaps one of Britain's most uh, highest quality, least impacted ponds up in the, the Cairngorms. You can the slopes in the back right of the picture are leading up towards Cairngorm. So this is what we call the lower stone moorland pond in the RSPB's Abernethy Nature Reserve on Speyside. Um, from some of the time you can see red throated divers out there, but it's a, a near pristine site. Um, in Mid Wales, we included this site, the Beggins in Powys, a National Trust property, again, completely semi-natural landscape all around about it. This is actually home to slender pond snails, as well as pillwort and fairy shrimps. Um, we included high quality sites like this on, on semi-natural grassland back on Otmore in, in Oxfordshire. Wonderful sites like this one. This is a pond in the New Forest. I'm going to refrain from saying the name of it because we tried to even, it's a, it's a, it's a fairly famous location, but it's a wonderful and very vulnerable and fragile site. This also is a, a slender pond snail site as it happens. And um, there are also medicinal leeches here too. But this is what we mean by minimally impacted high quality ponds, which tell us what ponds should really be like. And another location, which I expect many of you will have heard of, one of the pingos on Thompson Common in Norfolk in the Brex, uh, of course, an SSSI. Um, and this site, this water body, actually, this is a photograph by Martin Hammond, is actually a is actually a site with shining ram's horns in it. But what's interesting about um, Thompson Common is that I think this is probably the only place in Britain now um, where, where you can see both shining ram's horns and slender pond snails on the same site. So in ponds in the back of that picture in the trees, there are one or two uh, remaining water bodies that also have slender pond snails and not a thing that you see very commonly or I think anywhere else together in this country. Um, just before I go to tell you a bit about the details, some of the, some of the results in the National Pond Survey and things that are, are mollusky, um, I just wanted to step aside for a moment and mention our first practical work because um, right from the word go, we were interested, we were trying to apply our results and do practical things, though it took us quite a long time to really change the organisation to become much more practically orientated. But back here in 1990 at Pink Hill Meadow on the edge of uh, not far from Oxford on the edge of the River Thames. So the picture there is the River Thames. Um, and the, the dark area at the front of the picture is, is far more reservoir that belongs to Thames water. Here was our first practical project where we created a set of, uh, a set of new ponds and pools on the floodplain of the river there um, with the Environment Agency and Thames Water. So that's land that's owned by Thames Water. And they've been great partners with this all the way through. And this is now one of our most important practical and experimental sites we've where we've been uh, and probably the uh, longest running monitoring program anywhere, uh, I mean, anywhere as far as I know in the world of a set of new ponds. We we're still monitoring this 32 years on and I'll come back to the mollusks of that a little bit later as well. Um, so returning to the National Pond Survey, I just wanted to talk very briefly about um, what makes rich sites for mollusks and something, uh, again, a, a very brief scamper through um, the, the the principal effect of pollution on mollusks in ponds. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, now the first thing we did with that National Pond Survey data was start to identify pond types and we classified the ponds. Uh, I'm just going to talk about the invertebrates, mention the invertebrates briefly here. We did classifications with plants as well, but in the interest of time, I'm just sticking to the inverts today. And 
And this was really, um, so we first identified about eight main types of ponds using the National Pond Survey data. And, and this was really um, to provide a, a, a bit of an antidote to what seemed obvious to us, but um, was the, the mantra at the time that um, every pond was different and that there was no way that you could kind of get to grips with them and describe them, get any sense of commonality between them. And of course, in one sense, that's true, just as every oak wood is different from every other oak wood. But that doesn't mean that we can't recognise what an oak wood is. And the same is true, really, of ponds. And we use the data from the National Pond Survey to start getting that grouping and understanding of ponds, recognising communities that were characterised by specific sets of conditions. So uh, what we could see was that uh, there was a very big division between ponds that were relatively calcium rich and those that were acid. I mean, this is the dominant, of course, trend in fresh waters in the UK, so that was perhaps no surprise. But then there were differences in the depth and um, permanence and the type of hydrology that were apparent in the communities of plants and, and in this case in the invertebrates that we could see as well. And I just thought I'd mention something about how that reflected was reflected in the um, invertebrate communities in this picture. And I should just say that all of this, all of this stuff you can see uh, properly in full, written up in detail in ponds, pools, and puddles once it's out, once it's out there. These are just a few snapshots of pictures from the book um, that I thought you might find interesting today. But um, if you uh, there's plenty more to read about this once we once we finally get the new naturalist published. Uh, but what I just draw your attention to here is these the ponds here the bars show these different groups of ponds and they roughly go from left to right from more calcium the calcium rich ones on the left to more acid on the right and you can see how the if you look at the water snail graph uh the the top right hand side one there in the calcium rich half of the diagram that's the first four bars the the snails are more or less universally present and then they become less so less prevalent and uh in some cases they'll be absent completely from the more acid ponds and contrast that with mayflies below them, which are present in all kinds of ponds, and water bugs, which are present in all kinds of ponds, whether acid or, or alkaline. And the same is true for water beetles. Um, a bit like the water snails, second box down on the left hand side, the water slaters, you can see those really do like the, the more calcium side of the diagram and are almost completely absent from the more acid side of the diagram. So we were just starting to get some general, with that National Pond Survey, we were starting to get some general sense of what shaped the communities of ponds. And, and these patterns are really out there. And although, of course, truly every pond is slightly different from other, every other pond, you can recognize those patterns as well. Um, just to dig into that in a little more detail and in a little bit more mollusky detail here, this is a, these bars are those same eight broad pond types, those main pond types going from calcium rich on the left to acid on the right. And you can see, if you look at the colors, the gray bars are the numbers of species on average in ponds um, uh, from in a three minute hand net sample in those ponds. And you can see in the gray bar, in the, in the second one in, which is one of the calcium rich types, you'll see that the, the mollusks are uh, one of the richest groups. They, they're only really second there to the water beetles in the richness of species, the diversity of species that you can see in those ponds. They're obviously much less prevalent in the acid ponds on the right-hand side, but they really are a dominant group in the more calcium and nutrient-rich ponds, naturally nutrient-rich ponds of the lowlands and the, the calcium-rich lowlands of Britain. Um, just one word of caution here, I should just say our, our taxonomic skills in those early days extended to the to the gastropods and the larger bivalves. We have never really, um, we never really tackled in detail uh, the pea mussels, which were just a bit of a bridge too far for us in those early days. And so my graphs here are not showing, uh, don't include information about pea mussels, which of course are often found in some of the most acid sites. So when I say there are no, I'll, I'll show you a picture or two in a moment, when I say there are no mollusks here, just bear in mind that there might be the odd pea mussel that we, we don't have any gastropods in them though. So what did those National Pond Survey results show about um, the richest sites and the poorest sites? Well, as you will probably be fairly well aware, there's about 50 species of water snails in Britain. Um, and in the very richest ponds, nearly half of those can be found living together. And those are usually ponds on floodplains of larger rivers in the calcium rich south or in the, uh, the east of England, but certainly in the lowlands. Uh, more isolated ponds, it will be no surprise to you, I'm sure, have fewer species and a, a good quality um, semi-natural pond in clay substrates, again in the, in the south, in the relatively calcium rich south, you might expect to see on average half a dozen snail species. 
I thought I'd show you an actual list. I'm not sure how clearly you'll be able to see that on your screen, but again, you can see this in the book later on. This is the list from one of Britain's richest sites. This is it's, it's, it's this is what's so sad about Kennington. Kennington was a wonderfully, and it is still pretty rich. It was what a wonderfully rich um, snail site. It does still have a pretty rich snail fauna, obviously lacking the mixus these days. And there we've got just over 20 species in the pond. Um, so that is getting on towards half of the, the British fauna. And just for fun, um, and just to make the point to people who are lake and lake biologists, just to um, just to so they understand quite how rich ponds are, I've compared here the richness of Kennington with McCann's data from Windermere over several years. Obviously, a much much bigger site, and roughly speaking, there are twice as many species in Kennington Pit in a in a, a three three seasons of invertebrate survey work in one year's three season sample um, compared to the total fauna of um, Windermere. And the true, the same is true. Of, we also had some lowland gravel pit lakes in the Thames Valley that we surveyed quite a lot in the early days, um, and those two were no richer, even though they were, you know, quite big lakes, fifty hectare lakes. Kennington Pit had just as many species as those as well. Uh, there is another curious connection between Windermere and um, and Kennington, which some of you might be aware of, in that they were both places that have had mixus in the past, and both now have lost that um, particularly special species. Uh, and here at the other extreme is one of our Abernethy forest ponds. This is one of our National Pond Survey sites, a, a kettle hole depression in Abernethy, which we know as Abernethy Pond, Sir, Pond 4, rather unimaginatively. Um, and this is a place with no gastropod snails. So this is at the other extreme of that, that acidity spectrum. Um, I very briefly wanted to say something about the, the global effect of pollutants on, uh, on mollusca in ponds. This is something else that the National Pond Survey enables us to do. So the National Pond Survey is the clean, unpolluted, high quality sites. It tells us what the pond should be like. And following that, we also did a, a second survey looking specifically across the country at ponds that were polluted by a variety of different things to see what the effects of pollution were. And in essence, what that did was reduce the mollusk, the gastropod mollusk fauna by about a third. So in a a three minute hand net sample on average, we had three and a half species of snails. That, that might not sound like very much, of course, but remember that's the average for the whole country. So that's including both the richer southern sites and the species poor northern sites. And when pollutants were added to that, overall that reduced the uh, number of species by a third, roughly speaking, and actually reduced the number of individual animals by about a third as well. So, that was one of our first big investigative projects, the National Pond Survey, and goes on being important for us even today as a source of information and a uh, point of reference. But as I said a moment ago, we were starting practical projects right from the right from the earliest days as well. And I'm just going to come back to Pink Hill Meadow now and tell you something about uh, what we've seen at this site as well. And the two dates on this graph and on this picture are not a mistake because we actually created this site over two years. Um, we began work on it, the, the first parts of the excavation of those ponds was done in 1990 and we finished them in 1991 and the picture you've got there is actually what it looked like when we finished in, uh, in 1991. And there's an important link between this site and the previous information about the National Pond Survey, because this is really the first place anywhere, and I mean that it's kind of anywhere in the world, I guess, again, um, where we'd gone to, a, we, we designed a set of new water bodies with actual knowledge from real ponds, um, because before that, most pond design was kind of a mishmash of information and ideas from what people knew about lakes and about the way you looked after fish and a whole load of myths about what made ponds tick, which we had to dispense with in, in the early days. So this was really a place where we were putting new ideas into practice for the first time. And again, there's a there's a whole we could do a whole talk just about Pink Hill Meadow, and I'm really just going to pick out one or two points that are a, a little mollusk related now, rather than talking about that. And you can look at reports about that. And and again, of course, uh, once the dreaded book is available, um, we will be able to read a bit more about Pink Hill Meadow in detail there as well. Um, so this is what Pink Hill Meadow looked like. Uh, it's a plan of it. We made about 40 different water bodies on this site that ranged in size from the big pond in the middle, the main pond, which is about a third of a hectare, right through to deliberately tiny water bodies of just a few square meters um, in the four or five square meters. Um, and we've been monitoring this site regularly since 1990. So it's become, as I say, one of the longest running monitoring programs anywhere. And I just wanted to show you uh, a couple of uh, results from the 
invertebrate monitoring. I'm again, not going to talk about the plants at all here. Um, and the graphs here are from a 25 year on report that we wrote. So only go to 2016. We're actually out there monitoring right now for year 32. Um, but I'll just stick with these now because those aren't obviously aren't finished and written up yet. Uh, first thing to say is that here, because of various things we did, we created a site which has ponds which are uh, essentially that we, we realized at this point that we needed clean water in ponds and that pollution was the big was the elephant in the room for a lot of ponds. And we created a set of ponds which were physically and physically very diverse and chemically you know as clean as they could be. And this led to them being colonized very quickly and rapidly. And they became some of the richest ponds in the country. So we've seen 20% of all the macroinvertebrates that you can see in Britain just on this one site, the, the 750 odd species, and about 20% of the wetland plants that you can see in Britain. Uh, that's a list of about 350 species. All of those have come and colonized this site naturally. And as you can see, perhaps unsurprisingly, if you look at the top graph there, the invertebrates, the, sorry, the insects uh, colonized quickly. So the several groups were there right from the year, from year one, like the beetles and the bugs and the mayflies, perhaps no big surprise there because these are very mobile groups. What's perhaps a little bit more surprising is um, that the how, how slowly the snails have accumulated over the years and that even up to 2016 we were still gaining new species whereas most other groups the colonists had flattened out there were you know there were one or two species still being added but the the richness of the fauna was established and was pretty much stable <coughs> um, and uh, what I should say as well it was quite important a quite important demonstration of this site was that very quickly um, became the of the equivalent quality to what we later knew as priority habitats. Well, I'll come back to that in a moment. So this is an important demonstration site of the principle that we can make new ponds, which quickly become as good as the very best ponds. And that's a very important uh, point about fresh waters, which is rather different from a lot of uh, terrestrial habitats. No one would imagine you could make ancient woodlands in 10 years, but you can get very good high quality fresh waters in much shorter times than that. Um, the just to give you a tiny bit of detail, this is the this is detail from the book, but I just wanted to say just highlight those first few species that came in quickly. So no mollusks in the first two years in 1990-91, and then in year three uh, we saw a nice little costuma, Gyrolus albus, Limnia truncatula, and uh, as I must I still find trouble. That's why I've written it down on the slide so I can't can't forget Ampelaceania baltica. The wandering snail those all those four species came in in the fourth year and and other species came in in later years after that so that was the early years for us that was our first uh, if you like our first 10 years or so and um then we move into the 2000s when we're sort of talking more about we're beginning to look at um two main areas the ecology of freshwater in the whole landscape scale uh, the dawning realization of the importance of ponds, because at this point pond, ponds were still just sort of fun, interesting, um, and it was this era that we really began to realize how important they were, and that that culminating in the recognition in the uh, National Environment and Rural Communities Act of 2006 that alongside other priority habitats, good quality ponds were also worth including as well, and I'll just talk a bit more about that in a few moments as well. Um, ironically. Um, it took a project on river restoration. This is a picture of one of, our, one of our other big early projects, which I'm not really going to talk about today, except in this the data I'm just going to describe in a few moments. Um, back in the 90s, river restoration was beginning to be fashionable, and that meant putting the bends back into rivers that had been straightened. And it goes on. This goes on being a global industry, um, but despite there being a, a massive amount of evidence showing that quite a lot of it isn't very effective, but it still goes on as a huge industry. And we got into that early on to see what the effects of doing this kind of thing were and to find out what effects putting those bends that the, the picture shows uh, the bends that we put into what was a previously straightened bit of river down there. Um, and this is a piece of work we did with uh, the National Trust, who've been great supporters of ours and the Environment Agency in a European Union life project back in, I think, started about 1996. I think we got the money for that. Um, but what we wanted to do was to see what the effects of that restoration were, what the effects of those bends were. So to do that, we did a survey of the water bodies of the whole landscape. Um, oh, and just to, just to locate where that is, so Coles Hill is on the Wiltshire Oxfordshire border. So the river there is the border of those two counties, just to locate that for you. 
And these few slides here, this bit of monitoring around that work, uh, which was ostensibly about rivers, has been the most important piece of information that we've really collected over the last uh, 30 years, in fact. And, and what we did to assess the effects of that river restoration, and you can see the restoration site, that little square, that little rectangle, the smaller rectangle that says restored site in the middle of the picture there. That's the, that's the rectangle, that's where that picture was taken in the previous slide. And what we did to assess the effect of that restoration on, on freshwater biodiversity was look at the diversity of that whole landscape by going out and surveying a stratified random sample of 20 ponds, 20 streams, 20 ditches and 20 rivers to see what the landscape diversity was like and what the, what the river restoration did to it. Um, now, I'm not going to talk about the results of the river restoration because we don't have much time today. I'm going to talk about what the main result of that survey work was, because that was the first time anybody anywhere had actually gone and done what was really a very simple thing. Just look at where species were living across the whole landscape. And we found some very interesting things from this. There's a, a picture of the original paper there. And at the top, the top picture, the top two pictures show the site diversity, the so-called alpha diversity of sites. And what those essentially showed was that the, the, the rivers were richest, followed by the ponds, followed by streams and followed by ditches. So at a site level, if you go and look at the average number of species, rivers are a bit better than ponds and the ponds are better than streams and ditches. Um, what was important and interesting for us was the bottom graph there, the one with the red colors in it, which showed the whole landscape diversity, the gamma diversity, so this is just a list of the total number of species you see in those five different habitat types. We added lakes to this study later on. That's why there are lakes in that one and not in the previous two graphs. And much to our surprise there, nobody really expected this. It turned out that at the landscape scale, the, the list of species in the ponds was longest, followed by rivers and lakes and streams and ditches. So this was the first time we really realized quite how rich ponds were at a landscape scale, quite how important they were for freshwater biodiversity. And this really put ponds on the map um, of, of, was of course partly contributed to, to by the mollusks in that, um, though obviously other groups were making a, a contribution as well. And that, um, that kickstarted a whole lot of um, different initiatives and work for us. But the most important probably was uh, that in 2006, when there was a revision of what in the UK were treated as priority habitats and priorities for nature conservation, uh, ponds were then high quality ponds, I should say, so not all ponds, but ponds that are of high biological value, were then seen, uh, were then identified as a potential priority habitat. So that's ponds with rich or near natural communities or high sim scores or ponds with red listed species like Mixus or Amphiscola or ponds with habitat directive types of vegetation communities in them. These are all now water bodies that can be seen as that are identified as priority habitats and therefore a priority for conservation. And this story has this story in turn has has run a long time because in a few moments I'm going to show you a slide of the 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 first uh, national database of these which has only just been produced by Natural England and put on the government website showing the locations of the first 5,000 or so priority ponds across England and Wales uh, sorry across England it's just in England at the moment um, that are locations which are which should be priorities for conservation and, and that's more or less the first time that's been done anywhere as well. And I thought I'd show you a few pictures of what nice high quality ponds look like as we go past. Uh, yeah, okay, not doing too bad for time. Um, so uh, these are all top quality ponds in various parts of the country. This is a large natural, net, natural uh, kettle hole pond in Anglesey. A quite a big pond, so 1.3 hectares up near the up near the, uh, the high end of the size limit. At the other extreme, this little tiny peat pool in Anglesey, the home of uh, priority species dwarf stonewort, um, a fairly ordinary, a, a kind of standard looking pond. This is Bay Pond SSSI in Surrey. Uh, here's a typical upland priority habitat type, uh, habitats directive type water body that is a priority habitat because it has uh, shoreweed, the shoreweed community in it. Um, one of the one of the uh, Breckland uh, aquifer, aquifer fed fluctuating mears. These are priority ponds. Uh, a little priority pond on under Milbeck Common in the Lake District were priority because of its richness and the presence of medicinal leeches. Um, oh, back to my little pond in the Oxford suburbs, priority because of great crested newts and the uh, Cyclops uh, singularis. Uh, what what would have once been seen as an overgrown pond, but actually a priority habitat because it's got a rich long list of wetland plants. Uh, a 
pond which we haven't actually surveyed this pond i'm just using this as a, as a this is just a, uh I'm using this as a remote source of information from the from the photographer but this is a priority pond because it's got a rare species using it in this case it's got nesting red-throated divers on it and i should add that that's a, a photograph under license um so that era of um getting to recognize the importance of ponds was really important for us and has stimulated further activity which has kind of glow, grown rather rather beyond the shores of the UK in recognizing, in, in encouraging people to understand the importance of small water bodies more generally, not just ponds, but all kinds of small waters. And I'll come on to that in a bit more um, in the, uh, some later slides. So we're now coming to the 2010s and we enter a phase where uh, we'd realized that clean water is really crucial for freshwater biodiversity, that it's absent from large parts of the English landscape, especially in the lowlands. Um, and well, actually, the whole of the British landscape, really, in the lowlands. And um, at the same time, we realised uh, this around this point that we needed to interact much more with with doing things on the ground. It was all very well telling people things and giving them information. They often ignored that, or if they did take any notes of it, they didn't do it quite the right way. So this was a point where our organisation sort of took a slightly different turn. And as well as doing this kind of information survey and, and research type approach we also got much more involved on the ground and began that with a big practical project called the million ponds project uh, which the first phase of which was 2008 to 12 when we set out to make a lot of new ponds with partners all over the country focusing particularly on getting clean water into the landscape and making ponds specifically for a, a long list of, of uncommon species, some of which I've listed there with the numbers of ponds we finally created for them. And this is one of the places where we began to do some direct conservation work for mollusks and made quite a lot of ponds for um, shining ram's horn snails and, uh, and um, the uh, slender pond snail, I nearly called it a mud snail then. Um, which were the easiest to make, some of the easiest to make new high quality habitats for. It's not to say that there aren't other things, of course, that we need to do to protect freshwater mollusks, but this was quite a good approach for those two species. Um, so, for example, we made new ponds on the RSPB Sutton Fen Nature Reserve in the Fens, what were specifically for and were subsequently colonised by Shining Ramshorns. And up in uh, the north of England, in Yorkshire, on Strensel Common, we made uh, scrapes, we made ponds like this, this shallow, gently shelving basin that we did specifically for um, sled the pond snail up there. And, and actually, as, as well, in this case, was colonised by a whole load of pillwort. The, the lighter green pick, the lighter green shade in that picture is um, the fern pillwort. So this, as well as that kind of practical transition this was the, this is the era for us of trying to make a real difference on the ground and moving into the theme of what looks what works in farmland with our water friendly farming project and also recognizing as well um, that despite all our best intentions despite our advice despite our work there was still ongoing decline of ponds and as it turns out a, a broader decline in freshwater biodiversity as well which our information was showing and I'll talk to you about that, show you a few pictures about that in a moment as well. So this is the, as I say, the era where we began to move into landscape scale freshwater biodiversity work. And I've used a slide here from one of our most recent projects, the Ponderful project, which is being funded by the European Union right now. And those pictures there are, are of our water friendly farming landscape in, in the Midlands, um, which is a project which we're uh, where we are actually using clean water ponds, as well as investigating the effectiveness of lots of other techniques for landscape scale management of freshwater biodiversity, um, which has been one of our major themes now for the last 10 years or so. And I'll just, I'll just tell you a little bit about water friendly farming as we uh, to uh, introduce that to you. So this is it's a project that we started in 2010 with the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust and the Environment Agency in the Midlands in Leicestershire. So sort of halfway between Leicester and Peterborough. We have uh, three demonstration catchments. One, uh, the Barkby catchment in the picture there is, an, is a control where we're not doing anything. We're just leaving that to see how the landscape behaves in the absence of any interventions. This is typical lowland England farmland. Um, in, intensive farming, roughly 10% of it is, is woodland. The rest of it is a uh, few villages and intensive modern wheat, barley, oilseed, rape, beans, um, intensive grass and cropping. So it's very typical of what's happening to a lot of the landscape. And 
We've been employing measures that you'll be familiar with, like buffer strips and um, ditches in ditches bunded to intercept pollutants and polluted water from the from the fields around about, and measures to intercept water that's running off the land to try and slow it down, uh, and also adding new habitats to the landscape to see what effect we can have on biodiversity, and testing all of these to see what effect they have on the biodiversity of the fresh water overall in those landscapes. And I just want to show you. Um, two or three key pictures from this, because this is some of our most important information as well over the last few years. Um, and the first thing to say about these headwater catchments, these are in these are, as I say, typical of a lot of the English landscape. They only have in them ditches, ponds, and streams, uh, and that's quite normal. There are no water bodies in these landscapes big enough to be called rivers or lakes, and a lot of the landscape is actually like that. And the, the first thing to say is that if we look at the the average site richness of these water bodies. Um, we see exactly the same pattern as we found 20 years ago in Cole Sill, that the ponds are roughly twice as rich in species at the average site level as the dishes and the streams. And, and we can see that consistently over the years. We have a nearly 10, so far a 10 year monitoring record here. And if we look at the overall landscape richness, so this is now the total number of species in these three different habitat types in each catchment, we see again that the ponds have roughly twice as many species as the dishes. So ponds here are not some kind of nice optional extra. They are the richest part of the water environment. And that's true of a lot of the landscape. Um, so that's the kind of the, that's the, the base, if you like, that's the base story. Another very important story here from water friendly farming is that we see it describing, showing an ongoing decline of landscape level um, freshwater biodiversity. I, I should say here we're using the wetland plants to represent biodiversity um, because we can get much larger data sets like that. We broadly speaking, we see them matching the invertebrates. So this isn't this is I'm not talking to at all now about mollusks. This is broad trends in biodiversity. But what we do see here is a one percent loss of plants per annum in the period that we've been working in this landscape. So that's really quite fast um, and uh, is well, we suspect a pretty general trend. There are no other data that we can compare with like this because these are whole landscape surveys. These are censuses of all the water bodies, but it really does uh, look like there are widespread landscape scale declines here, which are probably occurring all over, uh, all over lowland England. But the good news is what we see from the measures. Um, because if you look at the top graph, We've been installing those measures I showed you pictures of in two ways. We have measures which are intended to control pollution. So that's uh, the, the ditches, the bunded ditches, the buffer strips, the interception ponds. Those are things that are meant to clean up water and stop the bad effects of pollutants that run off the land. And if we employ those, just those, which we've done in one of the two catchments, the eye catchment, we see that they stop the decline of the wetland plants. So they keep the, sta the status quo. So things stop getting worse. But much more interesting is in the second catchment, the Staunton catchment, we've done those kind of uh, pollution control measures, which are moderately effective, but we've also added new clean water to the landscape with clean water ponds. And those have a very striking effect because those add 25% more species to the landscape. And as you can see from those graphs, it's the, the red bits of the bars there, which show the total number of plant species in the catchment over the years. They're adding 25% more species to the whole catchment. And that really is a very striking change. And, and no reason to think that wouldn't be occurring with the invertebrates as well. Uh, there were no other data in the world really to compare this with so far, but we think this is pretty consistent with all the things that we've been finding so far. And even more striking for uncommon species. So that was the common widespread stuff in the previous graph. This graph shows the increase in uncommon species where we add clean water to the landscape. And for the wetland plants, adding clean water is nearly doubling the number of uncommon species in the landscape, a, a really big change. So that's been, um, that's sort of, that's, that brings us to the present day. It's, this is telling us a lot about the way whole landscapes should be managed for fresh water. Um, it's very popular catchment, so-called catchment management these days. When you hear the term catchment management, what that normally means is river management. It doesn't really mean management of all the fresh waters. But you can see that with this new information about the landscape as a whole, we're in a much different place to the, uh, the position that we were a few years ago, where really our water management was entirely focused on the river network. So now we come to the future. And this is the 2020s and, and what happens next. And I guess there are four things I just wanted to say briefly here, um, which are that 
This is the era of the recognition of the freshwater biodiversity crisis. It's a recognition increasingly internationally of the fact that all kinds of small waters are important. For us in the UK, and I'll show you some pictures about this in a moment, it's about the uh, we're, we're in a phase where we're identifying important freshwater landscapes as the focus for conservation efforts. And then we're thinking about how best to protect freshwater biodiversity overall. I'm sure some of you will have heard of and seen um, information from organizations like WWF about the global freshwater biodiversity crisis. And I just use this picture really as a, just to, just to symbolize that and make that point. There's an emergency going on in freshwaters globally. And with the, with the recognition of biodiversity as a, as a, as a thing, a bit almost on the same status as climate change, that is, that's, that's an important driver for freshwater, that international, that international status. But I'm not going to say any more about that part of it. But what I will say is some forthcoming stuff about the international recognition of small waters and wetlands as a whole. And now I'm not just talking about ponds. So we're talking about ponds and springs and temporary streams and small wetlands of all sorts all around the world, because the Ramsar Convention, the International Wetland uh, wetland convention is going to be introducing a new resolution about small wetlands specifically this year this autumn to promote to enhance the ways in which small wetlands are conserved and managed so this is actually a growing international uh, there's growing international recognition of this and even for those of you who are not particularly interested in fresh water this is also worth keeping an eye on because there's a very important uh, global recognition now of the importance of small habitats generally we've all been brought up with the I'm going to run over time by telling you this story but we've all been brought up with the idea that big habitats are best in fact you should have a look at the work the work of a woman called Lenore Farig who's a Canadian who's been leading this there's actually a, a, a there's there's actually a lot of myths in that and there's actually small small habitats of all kinds terrestrial and aquatic are much much more important than people originally thought Anyway, so just back to the ponds. So it's the era that we've recognised that freshwater biodiversity is declining and our own data is showing that's the case in, in England. And uh, as I say, this is pretty much the first of this kind of data. So I, I won't, uh, I, that's, that's the picture I just showed you, just to make that point again. This is the true landscape scale rep response of freshwater biodiversity. This is not the change in rivers or ponds or lakes or ditches or streams. It's the whole landscape that we're talking about here. So there's good evidence that that's, that's still occurring. And I think part of the solution to that will be with these small waters and, and another important scientific recognition that's really very recent. So this is from a paper written by a bunch of European freshwater biologists just last year in 2021, who noted, and I highlight this in a big red box because it's a really important sentence, that in the freshwater realm, we need new strategies that address the bias in research, management and policy that for freshwater is principally focused on rivers and lakes and largely excludes all other freshwater habitats. And the problem with that is that a very large proportion of freshwater biodiversity is in those other habitats. Um, in this country, um, from about 2015 onwards, we've been working now, so this is all other people's ideas essentially, we've been working though on the identification of important freshwater areas and landscapes which are the areas of the richest in freshwater biodiversity. And we're trying to bring these together on single, on single maps so we can prioritize areas for protection. At a national level, we're calling these important freshwater landscapes. And I'll show you a picture or two in a moment. And at a regional level, we're calling these important freshwater areas. And this really is a different approach. It's again, thinking about the whole of the landscape, the whole of the water landscape, not just say taking the approach of the water framework directive where we're trying to get rivers to some uh, notional, it's not that great, not, not that good, good status. Uh, this is about the whole of freshwater biodiversity. Um, and we're doing this by looking at concentrations of uh, in the landscape of, the, of threatened freshwater species and uh, to get the running waters well captured, the greatest areas with the greatest length of high quality rivers. Um, so two, two broad data types here that we're working with species. So we have a list of about a thousand species of conservation <laughs> concern. Amongst these, quite a few mollusks. So uh, this is the list of the mollusks that we're working with, which is actually, I guess, getting on for nearly half the species, in fact, which are scheduled in some scheduled or recognized as some um, scarce in some kind of way. And we're matching as well the with that the high quality habitat data, the locations of SSSI wetlands and water bodies and high status rivers and priority habitats that are wetlands and fresh waters as well. 
And we're mapping these together to find to find concentrations. So here's a map showing the concentrations of 10 kilometer squares with high concentrations of a species of conservation concern. That doesn't mean there's, there's no species of importance in between, in the gaps in between, there just aren't big concentrations of them. And the same thing for running waters. So again, these are the concentrations with high densities, uh, uh, many kilometers of, of high status rivers. Again, the gaps are not completely lifeless. They're not, they're, they're, it's not there are no high quality rivers in the gaps in between, just there are no concentrations of them. So we're trying to focus attention and, and effort into particular areas. And that leads us, that's led us to, to identify a set of uh, 24 or so important, nationally important freshwater landscapes. Um, I won't go through them all in detail here, but I've circled some which I which I know are <coughs> excuse me, which I know are places with important populations of mollusks in which uh, freshwater mollusks. <coughs> excuse me, I just need a quick drink. Thank you. Um, and of course, again, there are there are other places outside these areas where there are there are remnant populations of important of, of threatened mollusks as well. But these are the areas with the big concentrations. So we're focusing our, our conservation effort onto those big landscapes, and then within that, at a more regional and level of detail, we're looking for individual important freshwater areas. Uh, this, for example, is an analysis that we've done of the Brex, and you'll see that uh, number three on the list there is a. a physically quite small area, but really, really, really rich and important area is the Thompson and Stowe Beden Common area. That's where the, the pingos are. So we're identifying at these two levels areas to focus our attention on if we really are serious about trying to protect freshwater biodiversity. Um, our own organization response in all of this is to be focusing, I guess, in three areas, um, habitat creation, habitat management and species protection. And I just want to say a very brief word or two about our um, our work there and some of its connection to, to mollusks. Um, starting with a picture here of one of the places we can see that hasn't worked really very well and we've, it, it, we lost it in a sense before we even existed as an organisation. So this is a place that would once have been a wonderful pond uh, on Shortwood Common in Surrey. Uh, in the 60s and 70s it was probably the most inland site for Anisus Vorticulus. Uh, long before we arrived there in 1999, it's likely that that species had disappeared, along with other special species that were also present at the site at the same time, some plants that are nutrient sensitive. When we were there, uh, brown sedge, Cypress fuscus, which is one of our rarest sedges, was still hanging on and may still be present. Um, but this site, you can get a bit of a sense of what it's like now, it, although it is on an SSSI, SSSI common, um, it's got a terrible infestation of uh, parrot's feather, so that big green sheet in the front of the picture there is a huge area of parrot's feather and you can see there's been building work literally right on the edge of the pond so there's a um, there's the, the man from Del Monte's UK headquarters is literally built right on the edge of this pond so this is a site which really has been uh, the, the special quality of this site which would once have been amazing has been lost so we've we've failed there I guess you have to accept but uh, more positively um, there's been work to work with some of the most endangered uh, freshwater mollusks, we've, which we've done a little bit of. We haven't, we've done a, a little tiny bit of work with the glutinous snail, which we feel a special sort of uh, sad connection to because of Kennington. Most of that work has been done by other people at Lynn Tegard, not least Martin, um, who worked, who has worked with one of our colleagues, uh, Ian Hughes. Um, but most of that work has been happily dealt with by other people. We've done a very little bit of work on pearl mussels. Again, plenty of other people doing work on that. We, we, haven't, we haven't needed to intervene in, in, to, to get involved in much of that, though we are working now on a particular uh, Welsh population of Margaretifera in the Irvine, which is on the verge of extinction as well, that people hadn't been paying much attention to previously. But we have done a bit of work more on the, on the slender pond snail uh, on Omphiscola, uh, including uh, I'll just mention these, I'm not going to talk again in detail about these, but surveys across the country in our pond network, um, habitat protection and management work at a number of locations where we've actually physically been working on the ground to look after the species, a range of other flagship pond sites across the country which we've identified for this species. As I showed you earlier on, we've been doing some habitat creation specifically for this species. But what I wanted to show you most of all here quickly in running through that list was the third, the final thing on this list, um, incorporating, making sure that slender pond snail, along with many other species, are incorporated on this priority ponds map. 
uh, which has literally just been published in the last couple of months by Natural England. So you can go online now, and this so this is on the government website on the .gov.uk website. And here's a map of the first 5,000 or so priority ponds that we believe exist. There are probably 50,000 altogether, so there's quite a long way to go, but the first 5,000 is at least a good start. And what I've done here is pick out, highlight the ones which are uh, known for mud, mud snail. So just to say, this is not a this is not a distribution map, so you'll instantly be thinking, surely there's many more places with mud snails. Of course there are. This is a map that shows actual water bodies localized to the individual water bodies that are known to support the species, so that people working in those areas know that they're there, can look on a, on a database and see, okay, that pond has this species, so I need to be careful doing something positive, not doing something might, that might be negative, and just to look a bit more closely at what that means in reality. So here is, um, Bowness on Solway, uh, the Bowness on Solway SSSI, which is a small nature reserve that's managed by the Cumbria Wildlife Trust, and and is a and is a slender pond snail site. And on that on that map, we now have the exact locations of individual water bodies that have um, the 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 Omphiscola, the the pond snail in it. And you might be thinking. Oh, some of those dots don't seem to be on water bodies, but actually that's reflecting the underlying quality of the map here, because all of those dots have a little, uh, if you hover over them, you'll see that they're allocated to an individual water body. And uh, that one, for example, is pond nine, where the, uh, the mud snail is right on the edge of the pond. You can see the topmost dot in that picture looks like it's next to the road and maybe in the wrong place. In fact, if you hover over that, you can see that that's actually a survey of a ditch on the edge of the reserve, where there were also mud snails. So this is really precise now localization of these species to help us exactly protect the individual sites. Right, so I'm nearly done. My last, my last point I wanted to make, which was actually um, me sort of coming back to you and asking you a question that I wanted, I was interested to, to discuss with you. Because um, I wanted to turn to what is essentially the Conchological Society's work in this paper um, from Charlie Althwaite and a bunch of people published back in 2020, which I expect some of you will recognize, which is a huge analysis um, using some very complicated statistical techniques, uh, looking at trends in Britain's freshwater and terrestrial biodiversity. So this isn't just at all about freshwater, this is about um, using uh, recording scheme data to detect trends in the in the biota of, of the UK. And this is important because this information is being used now in assessments of the state of nature, the big the big project run by the RSPB. So this information is actually quite influential, I think. And I'm interested to know um, what you think about the freshwater mollusk part of this, because I'm not sure whether to believe it completely. So in this in this big paper, um, this summarizes some of the analysis. They picked out the freshwater species specifically and saw some very striking and um, to my mind, slightly odd trends. Um, some what they see is in most of the species, if you look at those graphs. So this is a summarization of the individual species. We'll look briefly at the individual species in a moment. This is the broad groups of, of freshwater things they looked at, bugs, caddis, dragonflies, mayflies, non-marine mollusks, and stoneflies. And you'll see, I think, there's a just a distinct pattern in most of those groups with them seemingly just from recording scheme data now and this kept this uh, rather uh, fancy stats analysis uh, they're seeing a decline through to the early 90s and the the 1990s to 2000 followed by recovery in all of those groups except for the mollusks which seem to be showing a general ongoing downward trend um, I'm very interested to know what you think about this. And this graph, this picture, uh, which looks terribly complicated, but actually I've just shown that to show you how these individual species trends have been lumped together to make that broad trend. And if you look at those, the, the red ones, uh, in a sense doesn't matter, I'll mention one or two species in a moment, doesn't, in a sense it doesn't really matter what the species are, but you can see, I think, there are a lot of broad downward trends there over that period, apparently reflecting that broad downward trend in mollusks, with some exceptions where I've put the red arrows. So seemingly, Pfizer Acuta has been on the up since the recording scheme started in the 70s, or the data at least that they're using from recording schemes. Um, perhaps surprisingly, Omphiscola has been on the up since the 1970s. And Segmentina, so that's the right hand of those red arrows, Segmentina knitted uh, went up a bit. Well, so I guess it sort of went down. And then it went up in the early 
2000s and then it's gone back down again and I'm very interested to know from you whether you think these trends are plausible or if there's something funny going on here so finally um that perhaps if we've got time for a bit of discussion I'd be interested to hear about that and any other questions you have just to say then just to summarize finally so um we freshwater habitats trust um have been and we're going on protecting freshwater biodiversity we're really focused on freshwater biodiversity um, inevitably, mollusks are naturally a significant part of that work for us. Though we're doing lots of other, working on lots of other species as well, because we are principally a habitat organisation rather than a purely species organisation. And for us, we see um, habitat protection, protecting the best, including work to protect the species in those the, the important species in those areas, um, protecting the best, building out with new high quality habitats are the most likely routes to be stopping the decline of freshwater life, including, we hope, that of mollusks as well. <laughs>